Mike, it's been a little while since we talked about a disaster. I'm not so sure about that. We just spoke about the Shanghai disaster, which is literally called disaster. The Battle of Palmdale, I guess Black Friday too. These are just big disasters we've been talking about recently. Yeah, the, the last one really is a tragedy. It certainly can be. Well, we're back at it today, and we got to travel back to 1917 for this topic. Hey, look, and we've also traveled to Canada. Welcome to 1917 Halifax, Nova Scotia. Oh, I don't have data roaming time on. I wasn't ready for this trip across the seas. Uh, that's a bummer, and so is whatever happened here. All I can see is broken trees, flattened houses, destroyed trains, and more. I mean, there's still dust in the air. What in the world happened? It looks like a bomb went off. Well, it wasn't a bomb, at least not in a traditional sense. Let's find a way home and talk about it. Hey, look, a Canadian time machine, a way out of this part of the script. Look, the Google Doc is back. I'm really, I'm, I'm pleased with the way that you've just, what you've decided to do in our space today. Um, it's a new interesting take for the show. But anyway, now I'll tell you a bit about what actually happened. But to do so, we need to talk about a bit of geography. Halifax sits on the eastern side of Nova Scotia, facing the Atlantic Ocean, and was initially built on the western shore of a harbour. By the date in question, it had grown into a major trade route between Canada, Britain, and France, and across the harbour to the east sat the city of Dartmouth. Because of its location and importance to trade, the harbour was also home to one of Britain's most important naval bases in North America. By 1917, some 65,000 people lived in the area, many directly employed by the shipping or trading companies to send supplies to Europe during the First World War. In fact, the weight of goods passing through the harbor had increased nearly ninefold since the years before the war, and ships from neutral countries looking to dock anywhere in North America had to pass through inspection at the harbor first. World War I, or the Great War as I guess it was known then, had put everything in Halifax and Dartmouth on edge, as reports of German U-boat attacks on ships crossing the Atlantic Ocean had spread. As a result, ships loaded with soldiers and supplies had to be escorted in and out of the harbour, and the city itself had been surrounded by a large army garrison, gun stations, anti-submarine nets, and more. That brings us to the Norwegian ship SS Emo. Imo? Emo? I'm going to go with Emo because it's a sad story. Oh, Mm -hmm. nice. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I like it. It was painted on black and never looked up. Dazzle camouflage. (laughs) You know, I just saw that on a TV show. I don't remember which one it was, but someone referenced Dazzle Camouflage. And I was like, aha! You know, I felt like the Leonardo DiCaprio meme, where I was like pointing at the TV. Anyway. Yeah, I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> I just did that. Uh, so the SS Emo had sailed to Halifax for inspection before heading south to New York. There, the crew was to pick up supplies and deliver them to Belgium. It arrived at the harbor on December 3rd and spent three days in the Bedford Basin. Now, this was a protected area on the northwest side of the harbor. There, the emo awaited fuel due to delays in coal being delivered. I really like emo. I just, I've I've really come to enjoy that name. I hope the ship lasts for a really long time. (laughs) On December 5th, the French cargo ship, the SS Mont Blanc, arrived from New York. It was fully loaded with the explosives TNT and picric acid. Also on board was a load of benzol, which is a highly flammable fuel made of coal tar. I'm not sure why you'd mix all these three things together on one ship, uh, but, you know, nevertheless, they also decided to round it out with gun cotton, which is another highly flammable material used as a replacement for gunpowder. The ship was in Halifax to join a convoy headed to Europe, but would have to spend the night outside of the protected area due to anti-submarine nets already being in place for the evening. The next morning, the Emo was ordered out of Bedford Basin, and the Mont Blanc was allowed in to wait for its convoy behind the protection of the harbor. Now, passing in and out of the basin required ships to pass through an area called the Narrows, which, like its name, quite narrow. Captains had to be very careful when traveling in the Narrows. They were restricted to a speed of just five knots in these waters, which is about 5.8 miles per hour. And they were to pass with oncoming traffic on the left side. Failure to comply with these rules would undoubtedly lead to a collision. Foreshadowing. 
me foreshadowing. <laughs> <laughs> Let's take a break. This episode of Ungenius is brought to you by Inside the Breakthrough, a new history of science podcast full of did you know stuff. Like, did you know the British thought they had polio wiped out back in the late 1800s? Then it came back with a vengeance in America in the 1950s. Inside the Breakthrough explores the idea of a eureka moment. It's historical wisdom mixed with modern insight. Think of it as a history show and a science show, but some comedy thrown in there too. Hosted by Dan Riskin, who is a comedian himself. If you're intrigued by science and discovery or maybe just want to have some fun new fantastic facts to talk about over dinner this is the show for you like maybe you want to know can you prevent polio by cleaning streets or who brought the first elephant to england i didn't really ever think about this until listening to this show (laughs) on the surface the show is a collection of fun entertaining and surprising stories from the history of science and dan digs deeper and connects these stories to modern day science as well and what medical researchers are facing i really love this show the production values are really great i love a good sound effect and this show has them and it's super great to hear the stories of how big problems are solved like i was listening to an episode about alexander fleming's discovery of penicillin and it's really great to hear thought process Processes, Dan does make the science come to life. Search for Inside the Breakthrough anywhere that you listen to podcasts, and we'll include a link in the show notes too. Our thanks to Inside the Breakthrough for their support of this show and Relay FM. When the emo entered the Narrows, emo entered the Narrows. It sounds like we're in a Tolkien book now. <laughs> kind of does. So when the emo entered the Narrows, it was traveling well above the speed limit because it had lost time due to that slow coal delivery. They thought, well, we'll just step on it and and get going. (laughs) As it entered the Narrows, it encountered an American ship, the SS Clara, going the wrong direction. Silly Americans. The captains agreed to pass each other with each ship to their right, putting the emo into oncoming traffic, as it were. It was then driven even further to the wrong side to pass a tugboat that was going up the middle of the strait. Does nobody follow the rules in the Narrows? I guess not. Oh, I'll go on the right, I'll go in the middle. No problem. It's, 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 it's chaos in there. It will be. This is where the Mont Blanc comes in. After being allowed into the harbor early that morning, it turned to enter the Narrows, and its captain spotted the emo about 0.75 miles away, and of course on the wrong side of the waterway. At the helm of the Mont Blanc was Francis Mackey, an experienced harbored pilot. He warned the emo with the ship's whistle to move back to the correct side, but pilot William Hayes at the emo responded that he would not change direction. Foreshadowing. <laughs> Mackey shut down the Mont Blanc's engines and angled the ship to avoid the emo, but the speed of the oncoming ship was too great to avoid a collision, even after the emo had cut its engines as well. The ships passed closely next to each other, nearly in parallel, until Hayes, who was piloting the emo, threw the ship into reverse. As it was mostly empty, remember it was going to New York to go pick up stuff, it basically swung around in the water, colliding with the Mont Blanc. The damage to the French ship wasn't severe, but several barrels of benzol crashed to the deck, quickly flowing into the hold below. After the initial collision, the Emo, still in reverse, poured out of the side of the Mont Blanc, causing a shower of sparks within the hull, which, you guessed it, ignited the benzol vapor in the air. As the fire spread, the crew of the Mont Blanc moved to abandoned ship, fearing an explosion. Because it was full of explosives. Of course. Yeah. <laughs> of course you'd fear it. Our TNT ridden ship is on fire. <laughs> what could happen next? <laughs> uh, people were gathering on shore to watch the ship burn, unaware of what was getting ready to happen. As the fire crews realized it was too large to put out with their equipment, they were working on a plan to pull the burning boat away from a nearby pier when it exploded. The explosion was massive, disintegrating the Mont Blanc and sending a blast wave out at nearly 3,300 feet per second, with temperatures reaching 9,000 degrees Fahrenheit at the center. I don't even feel like it's worth converting this to Celsius. It's just really friggin' hot is (laughs) the answer to that. (laughs) Chunks of white hot iron fell upon Halifax and Dartmouth, starting countless fires and debris weighing half a ton landed some two miles away. The shockwave was felt for up to 130 miles and an area of 400 acres around the explosion was completely destroyed. This energy was also fed into the harbor itself. The floor of the harbor was momentarily exposed due to the amount of water kicked into the air by the blast. 
A tsunami was then formed, raising 60 feet above the high water marker on the Halifax side. Every single ship in the harbor was damaged, and the emo was carried on shore at Dartmouth. To date, this is the largest human-made non-nuclear explosion ever recorded. 1,600 people were killed instantly, and 9,000 more were injured, with 300 of those later dying. Every building within a 1.6-mile radius was either destroyed or badly damaged. Hundreds of people who have been watching the fire were blinded before being killed or otherwise injured. That is a real explosion. Like, yeah. serious stuff. There is one small bit of good news. Uh, there had been an incoming passenger train due to arrive at the train yard a mere 750 feet from where the Mont Blanc had been beached before detonating. A railway dispatcher named Patrick Coleman learned of the dangerous cargo on board and returned to his station even as co-workers fled. He sent out an urgent message to stop all inbound trains. Coleman was killed instantly when the ship exploded, but his act saved the lives of over 300 people. Rescue efforts were brutal even as volunteers poured into the area in the minutes and hours following the blast. Many of the early responders were passengers aboard the trains that Coleman's heroic act had saved. The debris field made finding any survivors really difficult, and soon fears of a second explosion and rumors of the ship being hit by a German bomb slowed efforts. The following day, the area was hit by a blizzard that dropped 16 inches of snow on the still smoldering wreckage. Work to find survivors had to be stopped, and there's no doubt the cold temperatures claimed additional lives. This is a real bad time. It is. A nearby school was used as a morgue, led by coroner Arthur Barnstead. Great effort went into carefully numbering and describing bodies of the victims using a system developed by his father, John Henry Barnstead, to identify Titanic victims in 1912. Okay, I know this isn't the time for this, but what a weird family business. (laughs) <laughs> yes, like the kind of coincidental nature of it, mm-hmm. in a way. The blast did an estimated $591 million Canadian dollars in damage, obviously in today's money. It would just be an astronomical amount of money <laughs> yeah. in the 1900s. After an investigation took place, blame for the accident was put on the captain and pilot of the Mont Blanc, as well as Commander F. Evan Wyatt, the Royal Canadian Navy's chief examining officer who was in charge of the harbour at the time. However, anti-French sentiment in the region may have influenced the findings, as survivors, as survivors had reported that the emo was on the wrong side of the channel before the collision. The three men were charged with manslaughter and criminal negligence, but charges were later dropped, and in 1920, a court of appeals in Britain declared the ships equally at fault. The recovery took years, as you may imagine, with local leaders using the opportunity to rebuild the poorer areas of Halifax into more upscale communities, including the completely destroyed district of Richmond. Large public green spaces were designed, and many houses in the area were designed to withstand fire damage. However, communities of color struggled even longer as they were not given access to outside reconstruction funds. The damage had been so widespread and traumatic that for decades the city of Halifax didn't officially commemorate the explosion. In fact, after the first anniversary, the city didn't mark the occasion again until the 50th rolled around. In 1918, Halifax sent a Christmas tree to the city of Boston in thanks and remembrance for the help that the Boston Red Cross and the Massachusetts Public Safety Committee had provided immediately after the disaster. Something I think is really cool, that tradition remains in place to to this day. That's nice. I like that. Me too. A sculpture was built in 1966 to mark the explosion, but it has since been taken down due to damage and weather exposure. Today, there are several markers around the harbour honouring those killed. The Halifax Explosion Memorial Bell Tower was built in 1985, housing memorial bells that are run every December 6th at the time of the blast. Simple monuments mark the mass graves of explosion victims in local cemeteries, and the Halifax North Memorial Library displays a book listing that names all of the known victims. Our thanks to Michael for sending this topic in. A sobering story this time, but one that is... I mean, the sheer numbers are just hard to wrap your mind around. If you want to learn more about the Halifax explosion, check out the links in our show notes. You can find them on the web at relay.fm slash ungenius slash 124. There you can get in touch and send us your own favorite weird Wikipedia topic, or you can do so on Twitter. The show is at ungenius. 
You can find me there as ISMH, and you can follow Mike on Twitter as I-M-Y-K-E. Until we send our next Christmas tree to Boston, Mike, say goodbye. Goodbye. Bye, y'all.